Hello, and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive direc director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading center for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insights from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit rackleaf.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Holly Krieger. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Sally Starling Siever Fellow, Holly Krieger. In 2016, Professor Krieger joined the Department of Pure Mathematics and Mathematical Statistics at the University of Cambridge, where she currently holds the Corfield Associate Professorship. She's also a fellow at the Murray Edwards College. Skilled at conveying the essence of the beauty of mathematical ideas to wide audiences, Professor Krieger also regularly participates on the popular YouTube channel Numberphile. To date, her appearances have had more than 10 million views. Professor Krieger's work is focused in, relative, in the relatively new areas of algebraic and arithmetic dynamics. Her recent publications have appeared in the Duke Mathematical Journal and the Annals of Mathematics, two of the most esteemed journals in the mathematics discipline. While at Radcliffe, Professor Krieger is examining an emerging aspects of the connection between two fundamental fields of pure mathematics, complex dynamics and arithmetic geometry. Complex dynamics explore the inter inter iteration of self maps of functions of comp complex variable with connections to a wide variety of fields in mathematics, biology and physics to name a few. Arithmetic geometry is grounded in the classical study of integer solutions to poly polynomial equations. Lately, arithmetic heights functions have offered a new understanding into the study of complex dynamical systems. Although even the simplest families of examples display features not yet understood. Professor Krieger's project will develop and explore aspects of that cross-disciplinary connection with the aim of creating new mathematical tools and begin to answer new questions in the field. Born and raised outside of Chicago, Professor Krieger completed the undergraduate mathematics honor program at University of Illinois and at Urbana-Champaign. She went on to earn a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Following her PhD, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Krieger delivered the prestigious 2019 Mahler Lecture Tour hosted by the Australian Mathematical Society throughout Australia. She was the recipient of a London Mathematical Society 2020 Whitehead Prize and the 2020 American Institute of Mathematics Alexanderson Award. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Holly Krieger. All right, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, which I hope you'll all be relieved to know is probably the most technical mathematics that you'll hear in this talk. <laughs> so before I get started talking about some mathematics with you today, I, I wanna thank you, Claudia, and everyone here at Radcliffe for the opportunity to visit this year. Um, first of all, to be surrounded by such a diverse collection of, of expertise and knowledge is, is spectacular. <laughs> and also the opportunity to be back in this Cambridge and to work with my collaborators at Harvard has really been special. So that all said, I want to tell you today about some of the things that I'm thinking about um, while I'm here at Radcliffe in terms of my own research. And my title, of course, of course, could have been Complex Dynamics and Arithmetic Geometry and Height Functions and Equidistribution and all of these things, but I was afraid no one would come. And so my title of my talk is The Mathematical Elephant, and I'm going to start by telling you why. So I'd like to start my talk with this picture. 
This is uh, actually from a Kickstarter. It's a poster from a few years ago. It hangs in my office. It also hangs in a number of math departments around the world, which I know because I sent it to them. Um, and it's a picture of an object that I study known as the Mandelbrot set. But it's a very stylized and beautiful picture. So let me tell you, first of all, what I'm talking about when I say the Mandelbrot set. What I mean is inside of this picture, there is something which is outlined in blue here. That object is what's known as the Mandelbrot set. And this picture is a very beautiful representation of some of the features of the Mandelbrot set. You can see sort of in the embellishments here, if you zoom, some of the various features that we see inside of this mathematical object. And I'm going to tell you quite a bit about this object later in the talk, but I just wanted to start with it before I even explain to you what it's a picture of. Um, well, for a few reasons. So first of all, it's something that I study. This is not just like a, a pretty picture that I'm, I'm using as an example to sort of help you understand. This is literally something that I study. <laughs> um, second of all, it, it's, it has such an aesthetic appeal. It's one of the objects in mathematics that I think really has the ability to appeal to people on an aesthetic level and on a level uh, sort of inspire curiosity, <laughs> even for those of us who don't understand the technical definitions or haven't gone through the entire process of, of learning everything that we need to know to understand what this is a, a picture of, okay? And then finally, the reason I like in particular this representation, other than its sort of beauty and appeal, this representation, this Mandel map, if you will, is because the Mandelbrot set and this picture, it truly is a map. OK, it's a map of a collection of different dynamical systems. These are the mathematical objects I work on in the same way that a map like a normal map of the world is a representation of points in the real world. OK, so it's really a fantastic sort of visualization that I like to start all of my talks with. And I'm going to zoom in here on the right to this elephant. OK, so if you read on the right hand side there, it says this 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 part of the map is known as Elephant Valley. OK, and this is just a bit of sort of florid terminology, because if you if you sort of squint and turn your head and, and use your imagination, we see some elephant trunks here <laughs> coming out of the Mandelbrot set on the right. OK, but I'm not going to talk about the mathematical details of those, though they are perfectly interesting. Instead, the reason why I chose to focus on this piece of the map is because one of the things I want to communicate in this talk is what my experience of doing research mathematics is like. OK, and the reason I want to talk about that is because, well, first of all, you're all here in this talk, right, which means that you know that the person talking is a research mathematician, which means that you know they exist, which is more than I knew when I started university, <laughs> right, that this could be a thing that somebody could do to research mathematics, that there's new mathematics out there. What does this even mean? And I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of that experience. What is that like? OK. And so one of the ways I do this with people who haven't thought about mathematics in a long time in particular is to remind you or to tell you about if you haven't come across it before this parable of well, it depends on the sort of version of the story that is told so blind men and an elephant or blindfolded men and an elephant or an elephant in a dark room. Any version of this story which originates in southern Asia so. The, the story goes as follows, roughly. So we have some men who, for whatever reason, cannot see this elephant. And each of them is feeling a different part of the elephant, right? And the one feeling the side says, oh, I feel a wall. There's a wall in front of me. And the one feeling the tusk says, I feel a weapon. There's a weapon in front of me. And the one feeling the tail says, I feel a rope. I'm holding a rope. And the moral, so, so sort of the shallow <laughs> moral of the parable, is, is the subjectivity of human experience, right? That the, these men in their arrogance believe they understand what they're feeling, even though they don't have the whole picture, right? And if you've heard this kind of story a lot of times, it sounds sort of cliche, right? Like, I didn't know what I didn't know, this kind of thing. But there's actually a, a depth in the analogy to the experience of mathematical research especially the kind of interdisciplinary research that I do between different fields of mathematics. So none of these men are wrong <laughs> about what they feel, right? And in mathematics, it wouldn't be wrong if I started this talk by telling you the picture that you see of the Mandelbrot set here, this object, the Mandelbrot set, represents different features of different dynamical systems, okay? And even if I made that precise to you and wrote down the mathematics and told you what a complex number is and told you what iteration is and made every definition explicit, it doesn't necessarily mean that you see the whole elephant, 
right? And the experience of doing mathematical research, you'd still sort of be feeling a wall in the dark, right? And it's not until you, you sort of, well, walk around the elephant or talk to the guy next to you or turn on the light, whatever the metaphor you wanna use is, that you really start to see what you didn't know, that you understand that there are more significant features, okay? And the funny thing is that doing math research feels like that. It feels like a flash. It feels like a light turned on where one moment you didn't understand how two pieces of mathematics were connected. The next moment you do. And not only is it clear, clear as day right in front of you, but you have a hard time understanding how you didn't see it before. Okay, so I hope to share with you a moment or two like that, depending on your own mathematical experience. So in this particular case, this object, I don't just see a shape, okay? I do see a shape, right? There's geometry in this picture, but I also see fractals. I also see arithmetic. Arithmetic is a word that I use to mean the basic sort of counting numbers type of mathematics, right? Talking about prime numbers and one, two, three, four, five, this kind of thing. It's not obvious in this picture, but it's there and we'll talk about how. I see analysis. This is just a fancy word for calculus essentially. And I see chaos. And this last word chaos is something that I wanna start by telling you about what do I mean when I say that I study chaos, that this picture tells me something about chaos. So the first thing I need to do is clarify for you what I mean by that word. And the reason why is that in language, we have a lot of sort of interpretations of the word chaos, right? So again, to sort of appeal to the parable. <laughs> so you might be familiar with something which is relatively close to the mathematical definition of chaos if you've heard of the butterfly effect, right? So a butterfly flaps its wings, causes a tornado on the other side of the world because the flapping of the wings propagated some air currents that then develop into bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, changes in the weather or meteorology and, and so on. So the point is that this small feature, right, a butterfly flapping its wings or not, resulted in a very large change in outcome, which is the existence of a tornado, perhaps very far away, okay? Or similarly, maybe you've heard this sort of saying or, or par again, parable or phrase, uh, for want of a nail, the shoe is lost, for want of a shoe, the horse was lost, the horse, the knight, the knight, the kingdom, and so on, right? And again, the point is that a change, which was very small in the initial situation, has a large influence on the outcome, okay? So this is really what I mean by mathematical chaos. It's the feature that if I make a small change in some initial state, I get very different possible outcomes, okay? And the reason I'm clarifying this is because we often use chaos in everyday language to mean complexity, right? Um, so something like uh, a living cell, we might say, has very chaotic behavior because there's just so much going on. It's impossible for us to somehow describe it all at once, right? But it's not necessarily a chaotic system, right? If the goal is, say, for a cell to divide, yes, a lot has to happen for, in order for that to be a success, but some small change in the initial conditions resulting in failure of division, that's what I would mean by chaos. That's not something we observe, right, in that particular system. Otherwise, we'd have problems existing, right? So mathematical chaos for me is something very specific, which is this small change in initial conditions leading to very significant changes in long-term outcome. All right, so I mentioned that I didn't know what a research mathematician is when I went to university. That is almost true. I did know one research mathematician, and that's because I've seen the movie Jurassic Park. <laughs> so if you've seen this movie, you might remember that Jeff Goldblum is, in fact, a chaos theorist. And one of the scenes in the movie is him explaining to Laura Dern what chaos is, right? So this is the representation of a mathematician that maybe you've seen. As far as I remember in the movie, he does a lot of sort of laying around sexily and being carried out of danger by other people. So I don't know, sounded like a pretty good job. But his description to Laura Dern is as follows. So he asked her to hold up her hand. And of course, there's a division, essentially, as you can see, between where her fingers are and where the rest of her hand is, given by the ridge of her knuckles here. And he drops some water. And the first time it goes down one side of her hand and the second time it goes down the other side of her hand. And he provides some sort of um, not quite rigorous <laughs> explanation for why this is a definition of chaos. But for me, this is a definition of chaos because any slight change 
towards this side of her hand or that side of her hand and where he drops the water will result in a different outcome for the system, right? Meaning where the water ends. And a slightly better version of this, or at least less fake, but still a little fake, um, would be something like thinking about rain falling on the Matterhorn, okay? So if we look, so this is a view from above of the Matterhorn, and I've sort of roughly done my best to draw the boundary between Italy, Italy and Switzerland in red. This is also the, the watershed boundary, okay? So when rain falls on, on the, the, this side of the boundary, we end up in Switzerland, the water ends up in Switzerland. When it falls on this side of the boundary, it ends up in Italy, okay? So we could imagine this being a system, rain under the action of gravity, and the outcome we're measuring is which country the water ends up in, okay? If we do this, there are chaotic points on this map, namely points on this boundary where, which have the property that if the rain falls a little bit to one side, it ends up in Switzerland. If it falls a little bit to the other side, it ends up in Italy, okay? So this is a slightly less silly example of the kind of chaos that I mean, okay? And just a, a comment here that I'll, I'll probably use the word stable. All I mean by that is not chaotic. And so this system has some points which are chaotic, having that sort of sensitivity to initial conditions along the red, but it also has many stable points in the picture. Okay, so here's the math part of the talk. <laughs> I'm going to take some numbers and multiply them, okay? So I told you about a chaotic system. You can think of it visually, right, in terms of the map of the Matterhorn looking from above. I'm going to take a new map, which is the number line. Okay, we encounter this in school. And this is just sort of a way to arrange the numbers we're familiar with, including the whole numbers, right, one, two, three, and so on, um, in a nice order. And we can sort of visualize the numbers instead of just looking at numbers, <laughs> right, and their relationships to each other. And my new rule, my system, is going to be that when you hand me a number, I multiply it by itself. I square it, okay? And the dynamics part of this system is going to be that then I do it again, and again, and again. So if you hand me the number two, for example, that's what I have here in this diagram. Well, two times itself, that's two times two is four, okay? But now I'm gonna repeat the process, right? So I'm gonna take four and multiply it by itself. I get 16. I take 16 and I multiply it by itself. I get 256. I multiply that by itself with maybe a piece of scratch paper and I get this number right here. And then finally I break out my calculator and I can keep going as long as I want, okay? Now what to a mathematician are the possible outcomes for a system like this? Well, here's a few more examples. So the top one, I started with two, and I'm squaring, 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 and the numbers are getting really big, okay? Similarly, if I start with three, say, like I do in the second example, or minus two, like I do in the third example, the numbers get very large as I go along the system. On the other hand, if I start with something like one half, right? Now, it might have been a while since you've multiplied fractions. But if I gave you half a pizza and then took half that pizza away, <laughs> you know you have less pizza, right? <laughs> and so when I square one half, I get something smaller. And then when I square that one quarter, I get something very small. And smaller and smaller and smaller numbers are happening in this fourth example, okay? Or even something sort of less interesting can happen, like I could start with zero. And zero times itself just gives me zero back every time, okay? Which is indeed a pretty small number. And so I see two different types of behavior for this very sort of simple but completely abstract system, right? Which is take a number and square and square and square and square. And the two types of behavior I see are, well, the numbers I start getting are really big or the numbers I start getting are really small, okay? And that's happening. So getting really big happens for all numbers bigger than one. And for all numbers less than minus one, and sorry, getting really small happens for all numbers between these two, minus one and one, okay? So my, my system is sort of rolling, the rain is rolling down the mountain towards zero if I start with something between minus one and one, and the rain is rolling down the mountain away from zero if I start with something bigger than one or less than minus one. And the point is that this very simple system still exhibits chaos, namely, 
the two points in red there, minus one and one, I have a failure of predictability nearby those two points. I can't tell you with certainty what happens if I start at a point that's near one, because I need to know the information of which side of one that point is on in order to predict the long-term behavior. Okay, so there's a failure of predictability there. We have chaotic points for this system, two of them, in fact. All right, so I told you what chaos is. I said, here's a system that exhibits chaos. It has two chaotic points, okay? You might say, that's not very interesting. I knew that minus one and one existed before I came to this talk. <laughs> and that's true. But in fact, just a small modification of that dynamical system, so take a number and square it, results in very beautiful and complicated collections of chaotic points, okay? So instead of just two points, or more properly, if I were to think of this in, in a larger number system, the complex numbers, I would have a circle of chaotic points. Instead of that, I can get pictures like these. So here is a picture. In the upper left, these are six different possible dynamical systems. They're very simple. For example, the upper left, the rule for the system is not just square the number, but rather square the number and then subtract one. All right, so all I need to do is multiply and subtract. And the chaotic points, sorry about this, the chaotic points that I get then are this boundary here, this sort of beautiful fractal object, okay? And this is my collection of chaotic points for this system that is almost as simple as the one that gives me a circle of, of chaotic points. And similarly, you can see in the top middle here, it's almost hard to see what the chaotic points are in this example. It's sort of the, the end of the color changes. <laughs> so it's some sort of infinite dust living inside of this picture is the collection of chaotic points. In the upper right, we have this sort of like skinny lightning shape of chaotic points. In the lower left, just sort of a fatter lightning shape of chaotic points. Here's one that we call a rabbit of chaotic points <laughs> for obvious reasons, okay? And here's another sort of dust that has a, has a little bit of a cauliflower look to it, okay? But the, the point I wanna make here is that this definition of, of iteration and, and this very abstract mathematical notion of multiply, subtract, do it again, <laughs> results in these very beautiful and complicated pictures. And these are the kinds of pictures that I study, okay? The mathematical properties of these things. So let me be a little bit more precise. So inside of each of these pictures, there are some special chaotic points, okay? So this is the one that was in the upper right, the skinny lightning, right? This is some dynamical systems collection of chaotic points along this lightning here, this, this outlined in blue bit. Okay, and inside of this collection of points in this picture, I've highlighted some, okay, these are sort of glowing, these points. These are examples of points which are particularly special for the system. They have the property that when you do this procedure of the dynamical system, when you apply the dynamical rule, you only get a finite collection of numbers. You only get say 10 numbers or 100 numbers or 1000 numbers. It doesn't keep going forever with new numbers. Okay, this property is known as being pre-periodic. All that you need to know is that it's special, <laughs> okay? And some of the questions I'm studying while I'm here is, first of all, how many of these special points determine a dynamical system, okay? You can think of them as sort of landmarks, right? If I put you on a plane <laughs> and you didn't know where we were going and I dropped you off somewhere and I handed you an atlas and I said, well, there's a town say 10 miles north and there's a town two miles west. That is probably not enough information to determine where I dropped you, right? Two pieces of information. But if I told you where the nearest 99 towns were, <laughs> where the nearest thousand towns were, that's maybe enough information to locate where I've dropped you, right? This is a similar thing. How much information do I need? How many of these landmarks do I need to identify which dynamical system I'm looking at, okay? And a very closely related question is, how different can these chaotic sets be for two different systems? Okay. So I showed you, I guess you've seen now seven examples, right? Those six plus the circle or two points if we just look at it from a different perspective. Um, I've shown you a few different dynamical systems chaotic sets. To what extent does looking at that picture tell me what dynamical system I'm looking at? Okay. All right, so sometimes it's really obvious, 
right? If I told you there were no towns for a thousand miles, you'd be able to narrow down pretty well <laughs> where on the map you might be. For example, you're not in this country, <laughs> right? Similarly, sometimes two of these chaotic sets don't have anything in common at all, right? So let me explain what's in this picture. On the left-hand side in red is the picture, this was the one that was on the upper left when I showed you the six different dynamical systems. This is a picture of the chaotic points for one of these dynamical systems. It's the one which, um, or sorry, the chaotic points itself are, are the boundary between the black and the red, okay? And on the right here is a picture of a different dynamical system. And this is one of those sort of dusty pictures, okay? And what I wanna understand is how similar are these two dynamical systems, right? Can they share special points? If I know some of the special points, can I tell which of the two systems I'm looking at, which chaotic set I'm looking at? And in this case, that's really easy <laughs> because they don't share any points. So the middle is the two pictures superimposed on each other. They have nothing to do with each other. It's super easy to tell which of the chaotic sets I'm in if I hand you one of the points in the picture, right? Either it's blue or it's red. It's not, or sorry, rather, let me say more, more precisely. Either it's on the boundary of the blue or the boundary of the red. It can't be both, okay? So sometimes answering this question is really easy. But sometimes answering this question is pretty hard, okay? So here's two different chaotic sets for two different dynamical systems. Again, one of them is on the left in red, and one of them is on the right in blue, okay? The one in red is actually just a line, okay? The one in blue is one of these dusty guys. And in the middle, I've overlapped them. And they actually have quite a bit of overlap, okay? And they do have some of their special points in common. And so it's much harder, we need more information to tell these two dynamical systems apart if the information I'm getting is this landmark information of the special points, okay? All right, so how do I go about answering these kinds of questions? Well, these questions can be answered if we understand somehow all of the mathematical aspects of these chaotic sets at once. I cannot just look at these pictures and tell, okay? So I need to understand those things I told you about, the arithmetic, the analysis, the geometry, all of these aspects that come into play when I observe this mathematical object from all angles. So what do I mean by arithmetic? So this one's a little complicated. <laughs> and so I'm just gonna say it this way. So one thing that I said that might've been a little confusing so far is when I talked about this dynamical system which takes a number and square it, squares it, I told you that there were two chaotic points, right? But then I said a few more times that there's actually a circle of chaotic points for this system. And the reason why is because I was looking at two different maps, okay? Think of it as if you're traveling on a road, right? If all you're doing is traveling on the road, that's all you're doing and looking at, you might see road markers that tell you where you are, okay? That's very different than pulling out your phone and looking at the road on a two-dimensional map, right? So let's say my road goes through a city, and there's a ring highway around that city. If all I know is the road, all I know is that I hit this highway twice, two points, right? I go in, I go out. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you should be envisioning like the Deathly Hallows thing, right? Like line, circle, intersection. <laughs> so from the road's perspective, that's two points. But of course, as soon as I have the information of the map, I know that that ring road is actually a circle. So that's the difference, it's the change in map. Okay, if you like the mathematical terminology, it's just a change in the number system, looking at complex numbers instead of real numbers. Okay, so similarly, when these dynamical systems are defined using counting numbers, okay, or even fractions, or even more complicated generalizations of them, we can change our map. Okay, so the pictures I've shown you so far are like the picture on the left of the screen. Right? So this is one of those dusty sets of chaotic points where the chaotic points sort of live inside of the green there, and there's infinitely many of them. I can change the map and look at the chaotic set from the perspective of a prime number. Okay, And of course, this is sort of technical and it's you know, <laughs> hard to describe unless you do a lot of mathematics, but just be advised that it's just a change in map. But just like I was saying, sort of, you have to look at this thing from all angles to really have the full power of the mathematical tools at hand. This is an example of that kind of change in perspective 
that gives you leverage in understanding these objects. Here's another example of, of, a, of a perspective that, that allows you to get your hands on to understanding these things. And that's analysis, okay? So this is a generalization of calculus. And of course, I'm not gonna talk about calculus, <laughs> but, but what I can tell you is that this, this type of mathematics allows you to change or relate is probably a better word, sorry, to relate the object on the left. So the object on the left, again, the boundary between the black and the color is the chaotic set for some complicated dynamical system. Well, very simple rule, but a complicated chaotic set. Okay, if I wanna understand that collection of points, one thing I have in my toolbox is this, an analytic method. So this, this relationship between that complicated object on the left and this much simpler object on the right, which is just a circle, okay? And so I can use this mathematical tool to simplify things and hopefully understand them. And finally, of course, is the geometry, right? If I wanna know if two chaotic sets are the same, here's a really obvious distinction between two chaotic sets. One of them, so this is my sort of running example on the left, the skinny lightning, <laughs> if you like, I can imagine I could sort of walk along the entire set of chaotic points, right? It's connected, right? If it were a path in the woods, I could get from one point to another. But on the right-hand side, that picture of chaotic points, all the points are sort of in their own little world. It's disconnected. And so clearly the two pictures are different. And this geometric feature is actually what's encoded in this map, okay? So think about it in the following way. This map is colored. It's a map of different dynamical systems. It's colored according to, okay, embellishments aside, it's colored according to whether or not the corresponding dynamical system has a connected, so walk alongable, chaotic set or a disconnected dusty chaotic set, okay? This is sort of like looking at a map which is colored according to what's land and what's water, <laughs> right? It's telling you a feature of the point in space that it represents. In exactly the same way, this is telling you a feature of the dynamical system that the point represents. And the ones inside of the blue have connected chaotic set and the ones outside of the blue do not, okay? And so one way to rephrase the questions that I study is, if I gather enough information about my mathematical surroundings, if I know enough of these landmarks, these special points, can I tell where I am on the map? Can I tell which dynamical system I'm in? Okay. All right. So that's not the only thing I study, of course, this, this Mandelbrot set. I do study it, and it's also an example of a lot of what I study. But the picture can be even worse, because some systems are chaotic everywhere. Okay, so sometimes when you draw the picture of the chaotic points, it's the whole screen. <laughs> and then it's really complicated to understand how the special points interact. And this is this visualization I just wanted to share is a picture of exactly that. So this is two dynamical systems, the chaotic or the special points of one of them is in red and the other is in blue. And in fact, if you zoomed in any part of this picture, you would see red and blue, red and blue, red and blue all the way down. They're everywhere. Okay, and so telling them apart is very hard. Okay, but we can still do a reasonable job of trying to understand the extent to which they determine the dynamics. Okay, so that's some specifics of the kind of question that I'm looking at while I'm here. Let me just say, I mean, this is all part of a broader program, which is attempting to sort of build a bridge between the study of dynamics in math and the study of number theory. And dynamics, as you sort of might have gathered as I've been talking about it and chaos and this kind of thing, is really the study of, of chaotic behavior in simple iterative systems, okay? So for example, orbital systems is a very nice example of dynamics. If I know where the Earth is right now, it's not so hard to guess where it's going to be a minute from now, right? And so I have a simple rule for position now, position now plus one minute. Okay, but if I iterate that rule and try to understand where everything's going to be in a few billion years, <laughs> it's plausible that there might be some complicating factors, right? And similarly on the right here, I have a system. So this is a system which is a model for things like, um, for example, like capillary development in a placenta, okay? Known as diffusion limited aggregation. And this is a type of dynamics which has a very simple rule. So some particles are running around and maybe they stick together, okay? But again, you can see some very beautiful and complicated behavior results. 
Number theory, on the other hand, in particular, the type of number theory that I'm interested in, as Claudia said, has to do with looking at integer solutions to polynomial equations. <laughs> now, what does that mean? <laughs> what that means is I'm looking for sort of very real world problems in a sense. So I've got one on the left here, here's a question. Is there a right triangle whose every side length is rational and has area, which is a counting number? Okay, I can translate this question. Uh, you can Google the answer, by the way. <laughs> um, I can translate this question into some mathematical expression, which is this polynomial with integer solutions, la la la. Okay, this is really a question about how sort of the basic building blocks of arithmetic interact. How does addition and multiplication and whole numbers interact? And this is the field of number theory. This is the study of the sort of basic building blocks of arithmetic. And finally, just to finish, I want to say, what is the point? <laughs> Why am I doing all of this? I mean, so other than its own sort of inherent beauty and appeal, one of the things I find most interesting about these fields of study and studying these objects is that some of the simplest questions are still unanswered and we need new mathematical tools to answer them. Okay, so just to give you an example, here's our map again, right? I told you there's sort of land and sea, Mandelbrot said and not. One of the things we don't know is what types of dynamical systems in a very specific way live inside these sort of continents of the Mandelbrot set, okay? So the ones that we know exhibit some dynamical behavior called attraction, meaning that when you apply the map over and over and again, everything sort of gets sucked into one place, right? We saw this with the squaring map that things sort of came in towards zero if we started with a small number and applied the squaring map to it, okay? We don't know whether all continents consist of attracting dynamics, okay? Even though it's very simple to state the question and people have studied it for a reasonably long time, we still don't know. Similarly, we don't understand very well how prime numbers interact with dynamics, okay? Here's an even easier question than the last one. If my dynamical rule is square a number and add one, how many prime numbers can I get if I start with zero? <laughs> Do I get 10 prime numbers in the list? Do I get 100 or do I get infinitely many? Here's another question we don't know the answer to, okay? When can a fraction be one of these special points? Okay, so these special points, I told you I'm sort of living in the map of complex numbers, but what if I wanna really understand them as fractions or whole numbers, when can that happen? We don't have a good description of that. And the hope is that what the work I'm doing here is sort of the establishing these connections and, and sort of continuing building this bridge that has been developing for the past couple of decades between these two fields of study by looking at all of the different angles of these dynamical systems and maps of dynamical systems and so on will allow us to make some progress towards those questions. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your time and your attention. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Holly. This is an extremely fascinating talk indeed. Uh, and as you can imagine, there are lots of questions. <laughs> so the first one is from a physicist and he's a, he or she or they, um, this person. I'm a physicist and we have a definition for your example of chaos, unstable equilibrium. I thought chaos was something different. <laughs> so that's a very good question that sort of cuts to the heart of something that's quite controversial in mathematics, actually, which is, um, why are we making the definitions that we do? Why did I choose <laughs> that definition of chaos, right? So first of all, there are certainly other settings where people mean other technical things by the word chaos, and physics is one of those settings. In fact, it depends on what kind of physics you're doing <laughs> um, to know what kind of meaning you have for the word chaos. But the reason I use that word for, for the type of chaos that I study is that somehow it's the right object to describe certain types of mathematical phenomenon. And so it's not that there is some like universal, universal truth about what is chaos, it's that we wanna make the right definition to describe the world that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one that I gave you is the one that describes the mathematical world that I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, is there any basic rule that generates such types of visual graphs of dynamical systems with chaotic points? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Yeah, how did I make these pictures if these things are infinitely complicated, <laughs> right? Um, so in fact, there is. So one of the reasons why it's, it's easy-ish 
to, to generate one of these systems is if you think back to the, uh, one of these pictures rather, if you think back to the example of uh, squaring a number, right? I said, okay, for some of these numbers, they get big and for some of them, they get small. Here's how a picture could be drawn. You could say, okay, I'm gonna color the picture depending on whether it's big eventually the number or small eventually. And I'm gonna say big means larger than 100 million. And I'm gonna say small means larger than 100 millionth, <laughs> right? If I were to draw that picture, I'm not quite gonna get a picture of the chaotic set, but I'm gonna get a very good approximation to it. And that's exactly what those pictures are, is this, okay, I'm gonna look at the different types of possible behavior. Do I exhibit that behavior after some computable number of applications of the dynamical system? That's what the coloring is really doing. Mm -hmm. um, can a chaotic system be both connected and disconnected? Using your original examples of squaring, minus one and one are disconnected from each other. But if you expand to complex numbers, it becomes a connected circle. So doesn't the con context matter as well? Or do you always assume a complex system? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, so you're absolutely right about this squaring example, right? Two points like that, which are separated, those are disconnected. But I can imagine as soon as I have that extra dimension to work in that I just connect them up with a circle, right? So why is the complex numbers, I think if I can rephrase your question, why is the complex numbers the right place to look, okay? So the reason why it's the right place to look for what I'm interested in doing is because the types of dynamical systems I use are described by these polynomials. So these are, these are rules which are described by addition and multiplication and subtraction, okay? Just the basic sort of features of arithmetic. And the complex numbers are better <laughs> than other number systems when it comes to polynomials described by the counting numbers. And the reason why they're better is that these systems, or these polynomials rather, always have what's known as roots, always have values which can evaluate to zero Okay, or really any value that you want the polynomial to take. So this is probably how you learn. If you learned about complex numbers, this is probably how you learned that there's no real number whose square is minus one, right? If you multiply a real number by itself, you always get something which is either positive or zero, okay? In order to have a solution to that equation, we need to use the complex numbers. Well, in my dynamical systems, all of the time when I'm trying to understand the dynamical features, I take some polynomial which describes my dynamical system and I set it equal to zero and I need to have the solutions. <laughs> and so that's why the complex numbers are, are, are somehow the right setting for me to look at these dynamical systems. And you could certainly say like, well, that disconnected dust, if I just added another dimension and then I connect everything up, then it's connected from that perspective. Absolutely true, absolutely true. But mm, somehow, from my perspective, at least, that's, a, that's an artificial addition. <laughs> the complex numbers is really the right place to be for these questions. Wonderful. Um, if I understood you correctly, you're trying to differentiate between dynamical system based on a discrete set of points that give rise to periodic orbits. Is there any intuitive reasons why this should be true? That's a good question. So there's... So you asked the question in a slightly technical way, so I will be a little bit more technical than usual in my result, in my response rather. Um, so to a large extent, periodic points determine the behavior of a system. If I know, for example, that I have a point which is fixed for the dynamics, okay? So think of the squaring map, I had zero. When I square it, I get zero back again, and back again, and back again. But it's more than just that. I don't just have zero coming towards zero. I have all these nearby points. Remember everything that was sort of a small fraction, if I iterated under that system, sort of got closer and closer to zero. This is what's known as attracting behavior. And the attracting behavior, for example, the existence of an attractor like that has a very strong impact on, on the shape of, this, of the chaotic set, okay? And other features of the dynamical system. So studying the periodic points is, is somehow a very natural thing to do in terms of uh, these points being special. I call them special, right? They're special because they influence the, the picture much more than the other points do. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question asks, why is it important to compare special points between different fractals? 
what, what does important mean? <laughs> Um, why is it important in terms of like what kind of applications does it have is one interpretation of that question. Um, I know of no real world application of my work that I have ever done. <laughs> okay, um, I, I feel like I often need to justify that statement right so, so then why am I doing it right. I think that we live in sort of the best. <laughs> Well, I'm really get, you're going to disagree with this best possible time for the following thing, a very difficult time currently, but the best possible time for understanding that living in a society that has a basic scientific knowledge base is an immensely powerful phenomenon. Right. So rapid development of new technology, whether it's, say, a vaccine in a pandemic or something else is all implicitly based on having this somehow this this abstract and general knowledge scientific base. And so I feel that it's somehow very easy to justify the existence of, of abstract study of mathematics and pure mathematics, even though it doesn't have a direct application right now in that way. And so that's why it's important in sort of a societal sense. Now, if you want to specialize and say, why is it important to a dynamicist? <laughs> the reason why it's important to a dynamicist is mostly because it's there, right? So like we want to know like how much information do we need to describe a mathematical object, right? Like how many dimensions do we need to make a map of the world? Right, it's it's so, sort of one of the first questions you might ask. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, the next question starts with awesome talk exclamation <laughs> mark. Thank you. <laughs> to what extent do you study these systems with equations versus simulations? How do you think uh, about discovering the new transforms or ways to see the elephant? That's a very nice question because because I like to talk about the answer. <laughs> so. When I am proving things, if I am trying to say, for example, I showed you pictures and I claimed like, oh, one of these chaotic sets is connected, right? That lightning. How do I know, right? Like I just drew an approximation. How do I know? <laughs> so in order to know, in order to prove something about it, I use equations, right? I sit down and I do deductive logic and I say, I know X and X implies Y, so I know Y, <laughs> right? I mean, on a good day. But in terms of what questions to ask, in terms of even noticing that some of these things are connected and some of them are disconnected, that is much closer to an experimental science. For that, I sit down, I ask someone nicely to write some computer code to draw the picture because I don't know how to do it, and I observe, right? And so, so the discovery process is very experimental, whereas the, the sort of verification or the formal rigor in mathematics is more on the equation side. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment on two-step iterate, iteration, such as the Collas conjecture and systems that die out, for example, the convergence system, systems? Well, fortunately, this question was phrased in a way that I can answer it, and the answer is no, I can't comment on it. <laughs> I'm simply not fluent enough in either of those things to comment on them intelligently. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Um, do you discover the pre-periodic special points computationally approximately, or do you also find analytical solutions to these points? So that's a good question. So because there are infinitely many of them, uh, the best that I could ever hope to do is to write down some finite subset, right? To write down 10 of them or write down 100 of them. I can't write down all of them. It's not possible. So. You do do that, right? So one of the things that we looked at when we were writing our first paper on this topic was, uh, so one, we established this, this result for a particular set of dynamical systems that there is some number which is enough to tell you where you are, right? So 532 landmarks <laughs> is enough to tell you where on the map I've dropped you, except instead of 532, it's like 10 to the 100. <laughs> um, but, of course, we did do some computation because we didn't think that that was the real answer. We thought the real answer was, was much smaller, right? And so we wanted to know if I take two of these things, how many can they actually have in common? And the best we came up with was like 36 or something like that, um, which is much smaller than a number with 100 zeros. <laughs> um, so you can compute them. But again, when it comes to sort of establishing the theorems, when verifying your suspicion about what you're trying to trying to write down mathematically, then you really use sort of the abstract in order to do that. Perfect. So uh, a few questions about the uh, Mandelbrot map. 
Uh, is the Mandelbrot set a human construction or is it naturally embedded in our reality? <laughs> um, I would ask the same question about all of mathematics, right? I mean, here's something funny, right? That if you don't work in this, you, you perhaps never thought about. Um, we think of like easy, the easy mathematics that we all know, we think of the counting numbers, right? Like one, two, three, four. Does one exist in our world, right? I know one apple exists and one light and one computer, but I can't point to one <laughs> anywhere, right? It's an abstract concept. That, that idealizes or represents what we experience. And so to answer your question <laughs> with slightly less sort of like beard scratching. Um, so the Mandelbrot set arises naturally from the rules of mathematics that we sort of take for granted, addition, multiplication, iteration, functions, this kind of thing. So it's natural in that sense. It appears in the real world in the sense that we can see similar features in the real world, right? We see fractal objects in the real world, fractal behavior in the real world. Um, that, that example of, of sort of like, like blood vessel development in the placenta that I gave near the end of the talk is an example of that kind of thing. So, so we recognize some of the features of the Mandelbrot set in the real world. It arises naturally mathematically, but I would be hard pressed to say <laughs> what I think about whether or not it truly exists in that sense. Right. And the second question about the map is, can you elaborate on how the map of Mandelbrot set is a map of many dynamic systems when it is generated by one specific rule? Absolutely. So the Mandelbrot set is not generated by a single rule, um, at least not in a, in a sort of a straightforward way. So the way it's a map is the following. So the, and I didn't say this, so, so allow me to say it, but because it's a bit mathy and technical. Um, so I told you about some dynamical systems like taking a number and squaring it, or taking a number, squaring it, and adding one. Those are two different dynamical systems. They both appear on the map, by the way, the Mandel map. Um, for any complex number, okay, for any number, I could make the rule square and add that number, okay? And what the Mandel map is visualizing is if I hand you a number, I'm going to look at the dynamical system defined by, hey, square and add that number and repeat the process. The Mandelbrot set is coloring then whether or not the chaotic set you get for that dynamical system is connected or disconnected. Okay, that sounds really arbitrary and silly and fluid. Like, why do I care so much about this connected, disconnected thing? So uh, let me just sort of give you one example very quickly of, of why you might care, if you're me at least, is that the Mandelbrot set has a spectacular property. This spectacular property is that on many points on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, if you zoom in to a number on that boundary of the Mandelbrot set, the Mandelbrot it set, set itself starts to look like the set of chaotic points for that single point that it represents. Okay, that's a really complicated sentence. <laughs> so let me give you a metaphor. I mean, this is going to be weird because it's off the top of my head. But like, if you had a map of the United States that had the property that like when you smelled the map at a point, it smelled like the place that it was representing. <laughs> Right, this would be pretty spectacular. I, well, actually, it would be horrifying. But, but you get the idea that somehow this one object encodes features of the chaotic sets for all of these different dynamical systems at once. Okay, And so that's why it's spectacular, not because it tells me whether something is connected or disconnected, but because it's this one mathematical object that because it's a map, because of this map feature, <laughs> it encodes all of this information at once. Fascinating, endlessly fascinating. Um, <laughs> the next question is, does the shape of a stable boundary imply anything about pre-periodic peri points? Can you look at fractal shape and guess where a pre-periodic point might be? I like that question. So I've, I haven't thought about it in that way. The answer is sometimes, for sure. So if you think about that lightning set of chaotic points, um, it, the number three, sort of appeared in that set, like there was there was a piece going this way and then they sort of connected to two other branches. And in lots of points in that set, there were sort of three pieces coming together. Those places I know are, are special points, <laughs> okay? So there's some mathematical reason why those are necessarily special points. But in general, like if you think about the circle example, there are special points in the circle for the map which takes a number and squares it. And it's not, at least geometrically, very 
obvious if I look at the picture to differentiate between the special and non-special points? So the answer is sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of more philosophical questions, if I may. <laughs> uh, related to your Amanda uh, said uh, answer, where do you stand in relation to the discussion uh, on whether mathematics is in, uh, invented or discovered? Well, as you could sort of tell from my discussion of, of the number one, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, I Here's the thing. The experience of doing mathematics feels so discovery based, right? It truly feels like discovery. It feels like looking at the Mandelbrot set feels like looking at a I don't know, trilobite or whatever, right? And I'm examining its properties and I'm, I'm understanding it and it's there for me to understand. It feels so much like that. On the other hand, there is just no denying that mathematics arose out of culture, right? We count, we play, we measure, we do all of these things. And because of that, we have mathematics to describe it. And it's not even that much of a reach to imagine a totally different mathematical system, right? Our entire mathematical system is based on discreteness. There's one, there's two, there's three, right? Because that's our physical experience. But okay, it doesn't need to be the case, right? Like one could at least envision that it's possible something else is out there. And so, so <laughs> I don't know, I truly don't. Um, I, I don't mind if anybody has an opinion, you know, I don't think it's wild arrogance to have an opinion, but I myself do not have one. Got it. So it sounds like some of your work tries to make parts of chaos predictable. You said that chaos is by its nature unpredictable. So how would you describe this new intermediate chaotic predictable thing that you are creating? So that is a sort of tricky thing. You're right in your description of what I'm doing, but you can always, it, it's again sort of down to definition, right? The system itself is chaotic. I'm not claiming that the system becomes any less chaotic by my understanding, okay? I still have this same chaotic set of points. Their dynamical behavior doesn't change because I have this new information about them, okay? So it's just my ability to describe and characterize them that, that has changed, that has become sort of predictable in, in your language. And so, yeah, I, it's sort of, it's two different aspects of, of the object. One is becoming more predictable, this, this type of description of, oh, I, I can describe my, where I am in the map by these landmarks, um, is not the same thing as saying that the system itself becomes more predictable. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one last question. Can you comment on your sense of how time relates to your field of study? Uh, well, as someone else pointed out in the in the questions earlier, the kind of study I do is very discrete dynamical systems, right? It's not like I'm looking at a continuous system like, like the planets moving or something like this, right? Instead, I'm saying I have a rule and then I apply it and then I apply it again and so on. And so sort of broadly speaking, usually that type of dynamics is not a good model for systems that evolve over like continuous time. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some complicated ways in which <laughs> what I said is not quite true, but but that's that's sort of a general answer to your question. Got it. Well, thank you, Holly, uh, for this uh, incredibly interesting presentation and for your perspective. I also want to thank you, the audience, for your thirty questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackley virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at rackleaf.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.